You're with the American Battlefield Trust. I'm Gary Edelman. That's Doug Allman behind the camera there. And we are at Petersburg and we got lots to talk about. We already shot another video. You may have seen it up above that hill over there. We're going to talk about the Confederate position up there. We're going to bring up some Union troops. We're going to talk about railroads. We got more and we've got it all with Will or A. Wilson Green, uh, our good friend. Take it away, Will. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, we're standing down here at the base of Confederate Battery 5 which was one of the larger of the 55 artillery batteries protecting Petersburg in the late spring of 1864. One of the reasons it was the largest, one of the largest batteries, it was because it protected the route into Petersburg via the City Point Railroad. And you can see the City Point Railroad on its wartime alignment still here. Uh, we might even see a, a freight train come by. Um, this railroad connected Petersburg uh, with eight miles to City Point, which became the port for Petersburg. City Point was located at, is located at the confluence of the James and Appomattox Rivers. And Petersburg was a very big uh, port town, incidentally. Uh, it had a new customs house built in 1858. That's what kind of an international port it was. But because the Appomattox River tended to silt in uh, and create problems for deeper draft uh, ships, uh, they moved the port to City Point and then built this eight mile short line railroad to connect Petersburg with City Point to make it the, the port. So Battery 5 sits up here on top of the hill. Uh, it's manned by the 26th of Virginia, uh, five pieces of artillery of Sturdivant's Powhatan Battery. It's the afternoon of June 15th, 1864, 14,000 Federal troops of the Union 18th Corps have poised about 400 yards off to our east, ready to attack this position. Their commander is General William Farrar Baldy Smith. Smith was led to believe that the Confederate line here was so weak that he could simply walk over the Confederate defenses. Well, early on the morning of June 15th, he was confronted by a Confederate detachment about three miles to the east of us at a place called Baylor's Farm. Eventually, Smith was able to conquer that small position, but it made him very, very cautious. When he got within sight of the main Confederate line here, he did a reconnaissance and came up with this battle plan, which was to send a, a portion of his troops through a ravine that we'll show you a little bit later through which Highway 36 runs today, as well as making a frontal attack against Battery 5. And as we walk up towards the battery, you'll be able to get an impression about how steep this battery position really is. And we'll probably slip on the way up a little bit. Incidentally, by the way, we already showed you the railroad. Later, not at this point in June, but later, the Union would bring up one of the most famous guns, um, now famous, especially the Dictator. And they would run a little railroad line off of that one right over here a few hundred yards. We're not showing you that on this video. Um, over there where they would emplace the famous mortar Dictator, a huge 15-inch uh, gun that would fire a more than 200-pound round. Let's calm down or... Stop talking for a sec in case we're slipping up here. <laughs> and I'll watch out for the cameraman. This gives you an idea of how steep this was. And remember, these federal troops have to come up this steep grade. The men who involved in this attack were the 13th New Hampshire, 189 strong. And you know, they'd be lucky if they have shoes for each foot, let alone good, nice rubber soled sneakers or hiking boots that we're able to enjoy today. Come on. Doug is just showing you, I mean, Petersburg National Bra Battlefield is a sprawling affair and one to which you, the members of the American Battlefield Trust, have helped to add 2,000 acres of preserved land, much of which will come under the stewardship of the National Park Service before too long. Now, this first earthwork that we see is the Advanced Infantry Works. These were the places that skirmishers were located. This was not the main defensive line. But as we walk up over this infantry trench, you'll be able to see Battery 5. In case we have some newcomers here, infantry, the foot soldiers, they're walking everywhere most of the time, as opposed to, uh, you know, the cavalry on horseback or, of course, the artillery and whatnot. 
So these are the advanced infantrymen really protecting the main Confederate line, which I think you're going to get a good look at in a fort in the distance. Okay, now we have a view of the main Confederate defenses. That's Battery 5, those earthworks in the distance there. Now, what happens here on the evening of June 15th? Smith decides that instead of making a massive frontal assault against this position, he says that if the position is strongly held, a massive attack would result in terrible casualties. So instead, he decided to send a, like a reinforced skirmish line, he said. Only about 900 federal troops would make this assault. Two of the regiments would go through that ravine that is about 600 yards to the south of Battery 5 and try to get around behind the open Redan that Battery 5 consisted of. At the same time, the 13th New Hampshire, 189 strong, along with a couple of companies of the 8th Connecticut, supported by a couple of regiments over here to the, uh, to the north of us, would make the attack going straight up. Now, Smith wanted to precede this infantry assault with an artillery bombardment. And he sends orders to his artillery commander to bring up the guns, but unbeknownst to General Smith, that man had, that commander, a man named Follett, had taken away all the horses to be watered so he could not bring up the guns in time. So it was delayed even farther. So the attack that Grant had in mind at dawn on June 15th would not begin until after seven in the evening. Follett would bombard the position for about 15 minutes and then the infantry spread out in large skirmish fashion would make their attack. And it worked like a charm. The two regiments went through the ravine. They came in behind the Confederates and began shooting at them from their rear, while the 13th New Hampshire scrambled up this high ground just like we have part of the way, led by a, uh, a young officer named Nathan Studley, who his comrades said had a feminine voice. And he said something along the lines of, if we can keep going straight up, we'll capture this position. <laughs> and up the 180, 189 men of the 13th New Hampshire charged, they lost 30% of their strength during this attack. But as soon as they got to the top of the earthworks, the men that came in behind Battery 5 were there as well. And the Confederates either fled or most of them surrendered. All five of the guns were captured and Battery 5 was now in Union hands. I, you know, it's so easy for us to judge b both the idea of this guy's voice. I mean, you know, when you're hanging out, you're in school, you're at work, there's, there's these people with these qualities that we don't always ascribe to Civil War, to, to the people of the past in general. So I think it's great that you brought that up. I also think that, you know, when we are playing, whether you're playing a video game or a strategy game, or if you're a soldier and you've been in the military before, the idea of committing all your force is a little bit scary. But I will say that both sides of the Civil War have long histories um, of, of having a lot large force and only putting in a little bit of it here. And I'd be curious for you to put in your examples um, of, of when, uh, you know, the Union or Confederate sides really didn't add theirs in. And isn't it, isn't it Lincoln who said to Grant, once you find the enemy, put in all your men. Okay, here's Smith putting in one, less than one fourteenth of them, but it worked. And this was just the, the first of the batteries to fall. We're going to take you to a couple of other places. Uh, along this line that were also involved in the fighting on the evening of June 15th. Because when the uh, guns stopped firing on that night, about 11 o'clock that night, more than two miles of this Confederate line was in Union hands. Now Smith's 18th Corps had three divisions in it. Martindale's division on the right, Brooks's division, which made most of the attacks here at Battery 5 in the center, and a division of African-American troops under the command of a man named Edward Hinks was on the left. And this would be the baptism of combat for most of these black soldiers. And they would acquit themselves very well and we're looking forward to taking you to those places. Good, good. Uh, thanks, Doug, behind the camera. Thanks to Will and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation.